This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Heads of state and leaders from across the African continent converged in Washington, D.C. for the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit, the second such gathering in nearly a decade. This week on the program, while focusing on the outcomes of the U.S.-Africa Summit, we'll also interrogate at some depth the geopolitical context within which the summit is taking place and how this is playing out in Africa. And to do this, we pose the question, why did it take nearly 10 years for another U.S.-Africa Summit to convene? And why is one taking place now? I'm Penina Karibe. Welcome to Talk Africa. The first U.S.-Africa summit was held in 2014. Before we begin our discussion, let's look back at that first summit and what it achieved, if anything. Our reporter Daniel Arap Moy brings us more. This year's summit comes as Africa is trying to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and new economic and geopolitical pressure due to the conflict in Ukraine. In 2014, the U.S. committed to enhance the capacity of African militaries to better respond to threats of terrorism and transnational security threats. During the summit, leaders pledged to support African women's participation in peace-building efforts and support parliamentary efforts to promote women's rights. The Washington summit also resolved to expand investments in youth through education and employment creation. Eight years have since gone by, and many of the pledges have not been fulfilled. According to the African Union, Washington committed to advance $110 million in support of the AU peacekeeping efforts across the continent. But to date, the AU peacekeeping mission is still struggling to support its troops deployed to keep peace on the continent. The then administration also promised to disburse $37 billion in investment to Africa in 2014, a pledge that is yet to fully materialize. In 2014, at least 50 African countries attended the first U.S.-Africa summit. Four countries, Zimbabwe, Sudan, Eritrea and the Central African Republic were excluded from the summit due to alleged human rights violations. Eight years later, several African countries have again been barred from attending the summit. Relations between the U.S. and Africa fell to an all-time low after former President Donald Trump used a slur to describe Africa. Washington is now seeking to restore relations which were not prioritized under the Trump administration. Daniel Arap Moy, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Joining me now to take a closer look at this year's summit for Miami, Dr. Remy Piet, Senior Partner, Embley Advisory. From Kampala, we have Mr. Joseph Ochieno, an African Affairs Commentator, and from Beijing, Professor He Wenping, Professor and Director of African Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. A very big welcome to all of you. So my first question is one that I'd love to hear the perception or perspective of all three of you, and I'll begin with you, Dr. Piet. It's nearly a decade since the last U.S.-Africa summit was held. Where have this one now? Yes, I mean, obviously the relation between African countries and the U.S. has strongly suffered from the Trump administration that was extremely derogative towards, you know, African nations, uh, using a, a slur to describe the, you know, the, 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 the state of the, the current, you know, African economics. What the Biden administration has understood, however, is that Africa has a very strong role to play on, on geopolitics, especially, you know, in the wake of the current you know, Russian-Ukraine conflict, the invasion of, of Vladimir Putin of, of Ukraine, and the fact that, you know, African countries have not taken sides in, in terms of that conflict. And so it's very important for, you know, the United States to rebuild relationship, you know, strong relationship based on, on mutual, uh, you know, win-win partnership on, you know, free trade, uh, a series of, of joint investments to also try to, uh, you know, explain, you know, why African nations should support the, the Western powers in that, that current conflict in Ukraine. Um, there's been a series of different visits from Anthony Blinken over the last few months, you know, in South Africa, in West Africa, in Congo, 
reinforcing the importance from this partnership, but also, you know, shedding lights on the importance of, of African nations at a time where, you know, access to, to, to critical minerals, to mining reserves and so on will be essential for the energy transition uh, that, you know, the world is, is facing as of today. Mr. Chino, what do you think? Uh, you are absolutely uh, right to ask that, and I think that is a question that nearly everybody in Africa is asking why it has taken this long, but quite clearly I think most of them know the answer. The answer is simply that uh, the, the, the founder of this project uh, was a one Barack Obama, Barack Obama whom uh, Mr. Donald Trump, who replaced him, never liked. So anything that Obama did, Donald Trump attempted to, to break. And so, yes, after uh, years of Donald Trump, I think the whole thing went into limbo. But by and large, of course, it's also very much about uh, African, rather, uh, U.S. own uh, foreign policies and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and priorities. Uh, once Trump went, uh, um, I think Joe Biden came in to try and, if you like, cleanse the mess. And then here comes the war in, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, in which uh, America has really had to struggle and fudge. And I think, as I had uh, Dr. Pierre uh, I suggest, it is true the Americans were taking like a bit, little bit of a shocker when it became apparent that African countries were not willing to follow any howling suit for after a long time. So meaning uh, they were shocked that Africa was supposed to, were, were able to take a position and simply say that, look, you know, pick and choose. We are not necessarily going to follow what Anglo-America on this occasion say. So I think it is important that uh, President Biden now uh, rather uh, swiftly attempts to make the mending. Maybe it may be rather too late, but on the other hand, Africa is a, a continent that by and large needs both the West and the East, unfortunately. For that, they are lucky. Professor Howell, there are those who've argued that this is merely reactionary of the Americans to the engagement that China has had with the African continent. Do you agree? Well, I think uh, China's African policy has been always very clear. Uh, I can give you a very simple example. Huh? Whenever China's leader, like a foreign minister, pay the visit to Africa, I haven't heard any time talking about saying, oh, you have to pay attention to uh, other countries, some other big country, their intention. Uh, you have to open your eyes widely. Uh, you have to be always, you know, highly alert to who and who and who. I never said that. So China's African policy is quite open. Uh, we have never regarded Africa as anyone's like backyard, uh, either to China, of course. Uh, so this is the place belong to the African countries, to belong to African, uh, you know, peoples themselves. That is why uh, you can see uh, recent uh, 20 more years, because China and Africa jointly founded this uh, mechanism called the China-Africa Cooperation Forum. So in the year 2000, so ever since 2000 until now. So actually, uh, this is the thing, you know, playing a real role for Africa's economic development. So I haven't seen any uh, saying this is China the way, uh, it's maybe caused some uh, danger for instability, uh, because I just heard this voice coming from a uh, uh, US uh, this uh, defense minister. Uh, he said that. Mr. Uchino coming to you, the US has said that this summit was an opportunity for America to listen to and meet African aspirations. What are Africa's expectations from this summit? And is the U.S. listening to Africa? Yes, I, I think America is now very desperately trying to play catch up because I think uh, they took Africa for granted for a very long time, except that I'm not quite sure whether Africa, meaning the team going to the U.S., know how valuable they are partly as a commodity, but two as a continent, but a continent representing huge amount of interest and a continent that is actually now being watched by the rest of uh, uh, the global uh, uh, communities. I, I think um, um, very clearly, if I got you right, um, what the Africans expect, uh, I don't know whether that's what you meant, if, if, if what, uh, um, Africans uh, expect uh, from, from uh, the, the U.S., um, it's quite clearly very much the usual things about uh, trade. Uh, I think um, playing catch up, China, while uh, uh, the U.S. waited in the last 20 or so years, China came in um, historically before the 20 years or so, but when they came in much more recently, they came in with uh, money, they came in with investments in some of the infrastructure, they came in with investments in industry, they came in and opened up markets uh, for Africa, and they engaged much more openly, much more constructively. 
Right now, uh, most African leaders have gone to, 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 to the U.S. and as I understand it, there is no bilateral conversation taking place between uh, uh, any major African leader and the Americans. So it is really some, seemingly like something like a mini show, uh, 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 except of course at the bottom line, there's always strategic interest. I think as one of your guests suggested much earlier, is it what's going on in Congo? Is it about our resources? Is it about oil? Is it about gold? What is it that China is doing that we must be able to do strategically? You know, taking us back almost to, if you like, the Cold War, but in a slightly different way, playing it economically. Right. So, Dr. Pierre, coming to you, what we have seen in the past was the U.S. engaging Africa from the premise that the continent is not a strategic partner in the broad scheme of American foreign policy. So is the current strategy a paradigm shift? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Historically, the, the, the United States has been more focused on Latin America, for example, than, than Africa. Uh, however, when you had seen with the Obama administration was probably the most pro-African American president uh, and, 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 you know, starting to really develop much more elements of support to, you know, fostering institutions, um, strengthening trade between Africa and, and the United States, for example. What the U.S. has been going through, unfortunately, has been a complete breakdown of those relationships under the Trump administration. President Biden is just trying to catch up uh, to the these, you know, those four years of the terrible administration in Washington that are seen indeed at the same time, China ramp up their relationship with African nations. Now, what we're trying to see right now with that from the American perspective is trying to just reinforce a series of, of institutional, uh, uh, you know, perspective, uh, strengthening the voice of Africa. And I think that's something on which China and the U.S. actually agrees is that Africa should have more of a voice on international uh, negotiations today. And for example, you know, reinforcing the capacity of the African Union to have a seat at the G20, uh, you know, summits, for example, strengthening elements also of, of you know, building capacities for African nations. And also, as, as, as I was mentioning, you know, access to key resources uh, that will, you know, potentially, you know, support the future of the African economy. And, you know, just always playing on the trade card, making sure that with the Africa, you know, being much more part of global trade, that would strengthen the local economy. Uh, and, and I think that's what, you know, the, uh, you know, President Biden and the administration in the U.S. is going to try to reinforce of trying to find some key common grounds with African nation, whether it's on climate change mitigation, trade reinforcement uh, or strengthening of local institutions and, and trying to use that summit to rebuild relationship between Africa and the U.S. that has, again, you know, strongly suffered from the Trump administration. All right. So, Professor Ho, then coming to you and having listened to, to Dr. Pierre outline for us what the engagement between America and Africa right now looks like, how does the, the U.S.-Africa summit contrast with efforts by China, which has the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC as we call it? Yeah, well, there are a number of uh, differences, of course, also has some uh, common points as well. Uh, in terms of differences, because China, Africa, we have this uh, forecast, as I just mentioned, established in the year uh, 2000, but the uh, U.S. and Africa, they didn't have. That is why after eight years long, and then comes uh, this second uh, U.S.-Africa summit. Uh, that, is, that is why I understand my African colleagues saying maybe this sounds like a mini show. Uh, people from Africa, they regard this, oh, maybe this is because Biden now has been doing a lot of summit, especially after Ukraine, Russia, this crisis, this conflict. And then they had a lot of summit here and there with Latin America, uh, with the ASEAN country, even with the South uh, Pacific, this island country. So why not Africa? Now it's a very, I uh, agree uh, with uh, pro, uh, Dr. Piet, uh, he said, given those big background. So this is a background, you know, chances are driven the U.S. forward rather than uh, they are coming from the real intention, uh, the real those aspiration, trying to develop Africa economy. So I, I didn't see that. Uh, but uh, if you look about China, Africa, uh, with this, especially this BRI, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and all of a sudden, even myself, uh, I have uh, been visit, uh, you know, witnessed a lot of Chinese company. Uh, they all goes to Africa, trying to build the industrial park and this and that, uh, taking all those uh, big projects. So that's another uh, difference, uh, you know, the economic driven and also like uh, uh, how to team up with Africa to proceed with this uh, BRI. For example, uh, in the year 2018, uh, that uh, China Africa summit, uh, that was uh, September, uh, I still remember, just a couple of days, three or four days summit time, there were as many as 28 African countries. 
together with African Union, they all signed this BRI cooperation MOU with Chinese government. Right, so Mr. Ochieno, we all know there were four African countries excluded from that summit. That's Mali, Burkina Faso, Guinea, and Sudan. Now, we do know that Mali and Burkina Faso in particular are struggling with extremism. And my question is, how do you tackle insecurity without these countries on the table? I think that's a very important question, and I think uh, it's a manifest of the hypocrisy uh, uh, going on here. Because uh, in Africa, and particularly the mainstream, broad, <laughs> uh, 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 tropical Africa, when you look at many of these issues, minus the, the, the greater north, the, the consensual understanding is that most of the insecurities that uh, uh, is now being experienced, particularly uh, relating to extremism, will normally have been as a result of foreign policy failures by the West. And in many cases, many of these things emanating from uh, the, the Middle East uh, uh, conflicts, particularly the Arab-Israeli conflicts, which most Africans link to, if you like, the, the position of uh, particular America and, and Israel as a child, and then uh, the rest of Europe in a manner in which they actually treat the, the question of the Palestinian uh, a conflict which has been ongoing since I was a child. So if then that is the case, and you're saying that, well, these things moved from the Middle East, uh, went on to north, north of Europe, and has now found itself into Africa, and there's a hell generally, then it's a matter that really Africa is much more of a victim than a creator of this. And to do the, so uh, in terms of trying to look for solutions, you don't do it through isolations. Regardless of the nature of these regimes, understandably, that can be argued, you will not be able to do it without them on the table. If you look at all the regimes that have been invited to Washington, you'll find that some of the leaders who've gone and who've been invited there have, have got far much more wanting for uh, um, um, human rights records than uh, some of these regi regimes which have been left. So really, by and large, you know very well that while we are talking about insecurity in the broad sense, the business of so-called democracy, if you look at it, America still pushes for geopolitical strategic interest. All right, so we're going to take a short break now. And when we come back, we'll continue our discussion on some of this year's U.S.-Africa Summit, its context and outcomes. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Still with me are Dr. Remy Pierre, Joseph Ochieno, and Professor He Wenping. Now, before the break, we looked at why the summit was convened. Let's now take a closer look at its outcomes and likely implications for Africa uh, of this renewed engagement with the U.S. So I'll begin with you, Professor He. The Chinese ambassador to the U.S. recently said in an interview, and I'm quoting here, that Africa should be a place for international cooperation, not for major powers competition for geopolitical gains. So how can the Biden administration demonstrate that Africa is more than just a battleground in its economic and military competition with Beijing and Moscow? Oh, I think uh, a Chinese ambassador to the U.S., uh, uh, Mr. Qinggang, his uh, words uh, is uh, well said. Uh, because this is not uh, seen from China's perspective. I think this also fit with uh, Africa's voice. Uh, you know, I had some uh, frequent contact with uh, African colleagues. So, you know, whenever the U.S. Uh, team up with G7, like last year, put forward this uh, Build Back Better World, uh, B3W, or like this year's uh, this uh, PGII. So whenever those things come out, uh, has been even elaborated by the uh, West media themselves, saying, oh, this is a West version BRI. Uh, the purpose is trying to counter uh, China's those BRI now, you know, uh, doing a lot of uh, construction in Africa. Uh, you see, those ideas, uh, I think it's uh, full of those uh, cold mind mentality, uh, trying to uh, kick off this ideology, confrontation, also, like, uh, job, uh, you know, the Biden administration, uh, I think somehow they followed uh, the way, like uh, Donald Trump's uh, this kind of approach. All right, so Mr. Chino coming to you, we've seen Africa being wooed by various powers. Now we have Washington. We've seen uh, Moscow here. 
We've also seen Turkey. So my question is, in the midst of all of these suitors wooing the continent, how does Africa make sure that it benefits from this, it reaps the dividends and not just be used as a battleground by these, all of these major powers? I think you're absolutely right. That is actually the big, uh, the big risk and the big question. I have suggested on uh, related programs that uh, Africa actually lost a huge amount of opportunities in the last particular 10 or so years when it became very apparent. Of course, we are the richest continent in the world when it comes to the, most of the resources demanded and needed by and required by most of the developed nations. But partly because of our leadership and our leadership issues are not normally necessarily about this thing called democracy is basically just genuine <laughs> African <laughs> leaders who by and large have failed. They don't necessarily have to be how men or women who have been elected in the manner in which Washington is. Simply, we have genuinely lacked leadership. As a result of that, partly because of corruption, partly because of personal merit politics, the kind of things for which uh, um, scandals which would make a, a Chinese minister resign or a, a Korean minister perhaps commit suicide here in the, most of the African countries and, you know, you know perhaps people are, are slapped on, on the back and it's business as usual tomorrow. So we've lost opportunities generally. The suitors, particularly when China came up, you know, I suggested this several times, that it was a good and a huge opportunity for most African countries to begin to have conversations with China and indeed and the rest of the world in a manner in which uh, perhaps we upped our game and made it slightly difficult as a UT uh, to ensure that we got the best deals for our people. Not made easier by the fact that we have 55 nations, 54, 55 nation states, you know, clamoring and with positions which are neither here nor there. I have suggested variously, including my other columns, that perhaps um, maybe some of these conversations should be around the African Union. So perhaps next time the U.S. president should be coming to Addis Ababa, where we sit as, as a block, <laughs> rather than uh, going to Washington as individual nations, but still as a continent. Maybe we should be able to look back at what uh, President Tambombeke attempted to do, starting with the programs like NEPAD, and perhaps the, the NEPAD conversations led to conversations uh, that brought in the strategic new blocks, bricks, you know, <laughs> that uh, nearly perhaps shook uh, the West. By and large, Africa still takes us back to where we were perhaps 20, 30, in perhaps 40 years ago. I'm not quite sure whether we know our strategic interests at the moment. How much we're able to do this as suitors, uh, as suitors, I'm not quite sure. It is very clear, though, that at this material time, considering what happened recently in Europe, including the Ukrainian war, uh, considering the demand for the resources that we actually have as a continent, there's no reason why we do not have much more organized strategic engagement. Yes, I can see a positive push that America is being even allowing itself to have a conversation of a possibility of Africa having a seat in, uh, in, uh, in, in amongst the five, the, the five permanent members of the UN. Yeah, and you, you're talking about that, Mr. Ochino, and I'm thinking there's been quite a number of promises uh, made by the US. Now one of those is the $55 billion to Africa over the next three years in economic health and security support. So Dr. Pierre, where is this money and how will it be distributed? That's a very important question indeed in terms of trying to see how to disburse this money, not in terms only in terms of priorities, but also in terms of institutional channeling and making sure that, you know, that this doesn't, you know, fuel corruptions in different countries. I completely agree with, you know, my colleague from, from, from Kampala. Uh, right now, there's, there's a historical opportunity because indeed in Washington, D.C., you probably have the one of the most pro-African pro, pro presidents in the sense that, you know, President Biden was one of the very few voices that actually stood against the apartheid regime in South Africa. He actually very much follows the kind of, a, you know, uh, Obama administration that has, you know, tried to reinforce relationships with Africa and so there's a clear opportunity in terms of being able to you know benefit from any kind of economic support to the to the continent but again this is you know the the, the possibilities of this being you know uh, effective depends on the African leadership itself uh, right now you have only very few African leaders that have you know showed the, 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 the desire to you know continue building in terms of long-term perspective in terms of building in terms of you know seeing just the building of values and, and creation of value for African countries not just you know short-term deals on infrastructure, short-term agreements on, on being able to provide some, some commodities to different partners, but actually building institution and building the capacities for the country to move forward. You have, you know, probably the, the president of Niger is a good example. You have also, you know, now, now South African leaders have been kind of, you know, moving forward in terms of trying to make sure that those benefits are for the well-being of their people. 
but it's not the case of all countries in Africa. And, and when you're looking at $55 billion, as I was saying, Obviously, a lot of these are going to be focusing on, you know, security issues, especially when you have a, a series of countries that are still being played by terrorism, especially in West Africa. This will also be also of, of trying to increase transparency in terms of commodity trading. In the case of Congo, in the case of a series of, of, of key countries, whether it's Zambia for copper or, or you know, African, West African countries for gold, trying to make sure that these money actually serve the purposes of the population and not just, you know, short term deals on, on infrastructure. This depends on the capacity from African leadership to put in place this institutional framework and those key programs that will benefit the population themselves. All right. So as we come to the end of the program, this my final question, which I'm going to ask all three of you. And let's go back to that recent interview by the Chinese ambassador to the U.S. talking about China and the U.S. And he said, and I'm quoting, we need to extend, broaden our vision and expand our cooperation in Africa. Professor Hu, I'll begin with you briefly. Do you think this is achievable? Well, uh, if there is a wish, uh, there is a, you know, there is a will and there is action can follow on. So at least we should come up with this wish. Not only the words from Chinese ambassador, I also want to hear those words from a U.S. ambassador to China and also the words from a U.S. President Biden. So only the two good wishes now comes together. Of course, together with African leaderships, and then you can make things happen. So, so far, uh, I don't see like uh, some uh, very optimistic point of view lying ahead of us, because given now the China-U.S. relation, I don't think it's now very good. Uh, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, area uh, now is remain, a lot of issue not resolved yet. Can the two, America and China, broaden their vision and expand their cooperation here in the continent? Well, I, I think that there's, there is a way. Uh, I mean, it has to be a, a long, you know, term way in terms of, you know, having a steady effort towards this. The Trump administration has unfortunately, you know, threw out of the window a series of the key initiative from the Obama administration before. At least the Chinese were constant into their approach to Africa, and that's actually led to, to some result. But clearly here you have an historical opportunity for African countries, both in terms of their geopolitical situation right now, at the time of the Russian-Ukraine conflict, at the time of the importance of new commodities, copper, cobalt, and others, where Africa has clearly key resources for the energy transition. But you need to make sure through you know, the establishment of, of you know, well-enlightened leadership, not corrupt leadership in certain countries, but also the capacities of supporting local entrepreneurship, of building the capacities for the population to gain from this value creating, you know, a relationship between the US and, and, and Africa and continue moving forward step by step with the right institutions. The fact that the African Union might have an additional seat at the G20 is a very good sign. The fact that you might have key agreements signed this week in Washington in terms of trade is a good sign, but this needs to be followed up with, you know, long-term standing relationship and building values and building institutions in African countries themselves so that the entire population benefits from it, not just a, a very limited leadership. All right, and I apologize. Unfortunately, we cannot be able to get Mr. Joseph Ochieno for his final thoughts on that. But we've had a great conversation, and that is where we leave it for this edition of Talk Africa. A very big thank you to all of our guests. Dr. Remy Pierre, Senior Partner, Emily Advisory, joining us from Miami. Joseph Ochieno, an African Affairs Commentator, joining us from Kampala. And Professor Hu Wenping, Professor and Director of African Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, joining us from Beijing. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles on Facebook and Twitter. And you can also catch the show on our YouTube playlist. Do keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Penina Karibe, and the entire team here in Nairobi. Until next time, it's goodbye.